wants the Public Safety Committee meeting for Monday, July 1st. And this meeting is being audio and video recorded. So, end of the fiscal year, um, they brought reports on last fiscal year, um, and as far as the department goes, it's the uh, busiest year that the department's ever had by a significant margin. An awful lot of commercial activity, and uh, it's reflected in our revenues. It's reflected in the number of permits. Five thousand in permit fees. Yeah, just just in permit fees, not not counting the other uh, the other revenues, which are you know, our wages. Is that your contract. company? Oh, and here you've got the um, previous year. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. That's almost a uh, hundred thousand more than last. Oh no, wait, I'm, I'm looking at. Uh, no, it's it's a lot more than last year. It's uh, more than two hundred. Oh, I see. I'm looking at, I was looking at the bottom line. Okay, total furnace. Yeah. Wow, 200,000 more. So, a lot of those projects are ongoing. And so, we'll be providing the services, you know, the inspectional services for a lot of those projects um, in the coming fiscal year. Uh, but, I also, there's also a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of significant projects that haven't that are in the pipeline that we haven't seen permit applications for. So, yeah, I think we're in a in a significant growth period. The total estimated uh, costs of construction for for this year uh, uh, was seventy million dollars, and, and based on an average of about sixty million or fifty-five million cost of construction for other years. So it's a significant increase also. Um, and we're we're looking forward to uh, the hotel, um, the uh, Clark School Redevelopment Project, which it's, it ends up being about 40 units, but it's going to be a relatively extensive amount of renovation. I think the hotel was slotted for 108 rooms. Um, the uh, preliminary proposals for a redevelopment at the, uh, the, the, the uh, Clarion uh, with a new hotel and other office building uh, continued uh, renovations for the uh, Hillendale Mall are in play. There's a proposed uh, assisted living facility at uh, on, uh, at, the, at Hospital Hill that I think is well on the way to being uh, uh, permit having a permit application. I know that the uh, that the zoning that the you know, zoning approvals are in place, and I'm sure I'm leaving out some other things. I was sort of scurrying to curry to get last year's together for this meeting. I think that we're going to look at, at, a, at a not, I don't think an equal year. I think in, in my tenure as building commissioner, this may be the biggest year that I'll see. Um, it's a little bit like, um, you know when you caught your biggest fish. I caught the biggest trout I'll ever catch about five years ago. And I'm pretty <laughs> sure of that. But, uh, and this may well be the biggest, the most, uh, in terms of revenue, the biggest year that the department will have. But I suspect year. that the one that we've just finished but I suspect that we're going to see, uh, I, 
I'm anticipating that we'll see about $100,000 in revenues more than the two, FY 2012. So I think the, the growth is going to continue. Did you, did you mention Cutter Systems, too, or is that that's, that's in, part of that is in this part of it remains. FY14? Into FY14. The Williamsburg contract was adjusted in FY 2013 with $10,000. It's, it's to reflect their, their building a new school. Uh -huh. And, uh, and you know, there's good, that piece is going to require extra inspection services. So we did, we did adjust up at the end of, uh, as we see how the school finishes up towards the end of FY 14, we'll talk about that. projection is uh, in line with, uh, it looks as though it's in line with uh, the previous five year averages. That's how we, that's how we worked it out. We threw away the lowest, we threw away the lowest and the highest and then ran an average of the other years. Is that, is that for the finance director's methodology? Or? Um, it, it's, 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 I've looked at past years and I've looked at the ways we could have uh, estimated past year's growth rate based on the earlier years, and this is the methodology that I came up with. Um, and it, it's for department planning, for, as far as I'm concerned, uh, for me to be able to look at what we're going to need to provide the services and what we can anticipate for the for the uh, uh, amount of, of uh, work that the department's going to have to do. Um, and I, you know, we'll, if if we're we may have to make adjustments part way through uh, 2000, FY14 if we find that we're, um, uh, you know, have an awful lot of inspections to do. But we do have a procedure, and we've, let, we've left some in our budget to actually um, get uh, outside uh, inspectors in if we need to. <coughs> so there is a, there is some buffer. The ones, <clears throat> those are the ones that we logged and couldn't resolve in an expeditious fashion. We really encourage people to submit three, three counts. Three. We we encourage people to submit complaints as an individual. Um, you know, the idea of a counselor complaint. Generally, a counselor complaint happens because the person who makes the complaint has some fears about perhaps retaliation. But we, we really like to have it be pretty concise when we log a complaint. And again, if we have if we have a complaint and we are able to respond to it quickly and to not have it um, become something that's carried over, um, we just we just count it as done. So the 18 complaints from the fire department those are inter those are interagency. Yeah, those are when I those are when I get called at night and have to go somewhere because there was a fire. Those sorts of things. Oh, As a building complaint that I was uh, typically, oh no, you have a separate line for work without permit. So building complaints are somebody who has an issue in a building. Mm -hmm. And for the work without a permit line, do those folks get fined or? Um, Jen, for those folks to actually make it to the onto the list, if we go, if we find out work's happening without a permit, and we go to the job site and the contractor goes down and gets a permit right away, we don't log that. We're willing to let people, um, you know, make a mistake. Um, it's when it actually get where there where there ends up being some kind of an action taken, and the fine is not particularly expensive. It's fifty dollars. But those are the, when by the time it gets into being logged as a complaint, it's, it's uh, you know there's been that uh, work without a permit fine, and it just gets added to the cost of the permit that they take out. We don't log it as a separate fine. Yeah, I mean, what has been the effect of this stretch? Of 
it's presented some um, the the residential piece seems to have um, it's an accepted part of a residential permit application now, and it's and it's a pretty straightforward process. I'm not sure exactly how much it adds to the cost of a permit specifically, but it seems that um, it, most folks building new construction are, are actually going past the requirements of the stretch energy code. So it, it doesn't seem like it's had a big effect on residential. The commercial, there is a, an aspect of commercial new construction that um, has, uh, that people have commented on, and that's the requirement that after the building is completed, um, that within six months someone does an analysis of the uh, of the way the systems are functioning it's, uh, they've called it commissioning a building uh, and it's been there have been some buildings that have have been completed and and folks have had to go back and make some changes in order to make the building meet the requirements uh, so in that sense it's had an effect but i think all positive but by and large, for new residential construction, folks are going above and beyond the requirements of the stretch energy code. I actually expect the stretch energy code to, to change um, in the coming year because the international building code system, which is what our mass codes are based on, has come out with a 2012 uh, energy conservation code, and it's actually a about on parallel with our the Massachusetts Stretch Energy Code. So for them to make a stretch energy code that increases, that's more efficient than, than the current existing code, they're going to have to raise the criteria. Um, and so it's going to be, I think, um, the, for new, new residential construction, it's based on a rating compared to what uh, the sort of the baseline in, in 2006 was. And for instance, most new uh, single-family homes have to uh, use only about 65 percent of what a house built in 2006 used, and I think they might raise that to only using 55 percent of what the baseline house requires. That said, uh, insulation technology and uh, equipment technologies are, are better. You can get more insulation into the same space, and you can buy a like, a, for instance, a furnace that's for a water heater that's more efficient than it was even in 2010. So it, those kinds of uh, uh, requirements aren't going to, I don't think, present a big problem. They're not going to be a huge shift in, uh, in, the, um, in what it costs to build a house. Plus, like I said, most folks are going above and beyond um, the, uh, the, the basic requirements of the stretch energy code. The Energy Star, the current Energy Star ratings require that you go a little bit farther than uh, the Stretch Energy Code to have an Energy Star house. last thing I'd say is that every time someone builds something new or every time someone renovates an existing structure, it's a little safer when they're done than it was before uh, they started. Uh, not 100% of the time, but 99% of the time. For instance, the new hotel rooms that are being built are going to be safer than the hotel rooms in the existing uh, hotels in Northampton. So, that's one of the, th that's probably a lot of the focus that the building portion of the building department works towards is that, is that in increasing the safety of, of the buildings in Northampton structures. That's what we're doing. Good job, man. Right here. Right. Thank you. Uh, big truck. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer.
now to have the endorsement of the FY14 ambulance rates. Mr. Lawrence, present that. Chief of EMS. Good afternoon, guys. How are you? Thank you for adding me as kind of a late addition to your agenda. Um, Chief Duggan asked me, do you want me at the podium? Is it on? Whatever you want. Uh, yeah, have a seat, whatever, whatever you want. Great, let's see. Um, how's that? Can you see me okay right here? Um, Chief Duggan asked me to come before your group uh, this afternoon as we transition into the new fiscal year. As we have done in other years, we've met with you um, just to go over the rates, um, have the endorsement from this committee going forward, and just give you a chance to ask some questions and try to better understand uh, how the process unfolds as we uh, going to the new year. Um, the rates that I handed out uh, are no change from the previous year. They're identical to the exact same rates. Um, we just obviously finished up last fiscal year. Um, when we started fiscal year 2013, um, that was the first year that all the revenue went into the general account. Um, so that was one big shift that we did with this uh, previous fiscal year. Um, obviously, going forward, it still holds uh, all the revenue coming in goes into the general fund. This year, we collected right around um, 1.67 million, roughly. I don't have the exact number, but it was around 1.67 million um, that we collected just this past fiscal year. Um, we anticipate the call volume being roughly the same. Um, the two drivers that dictate how much revenue comes into the city, obviously, number one is call volume and the number of transports. And then in addition to that is the nature of the call, whether it's a BLS or ALS, so the severity of it. As you look at the list in front of you, just to better explain what you're looking at, um, obviously the first one, mileage, pretty self-explanatory. Depending on how many miles you travel, you can bill that rate in front of you. Um, and then you also have the ALS non-emergency rate. I'm, I'm, do you want a copy? Sure. I should have called it. I should have given you one earlier. Not a problem. I'll send it to my boss. Thank there you. you. Go. The ALS non-emergency. What that non-emergency means is those are basically your non-emergency transports. For example, one coming out of the hospital. Um, a patient may be transferred down to Bay State Medical Center or another healthcare facility for whatever reason to do a different type of procedure or to do dialysis call or something like that. Um, understand that the non-emergency calls and the inter-facility transfers, we do very little um, throughout the year because mostly those are done by contracted private ambulance services. So what we typically do is the ALS emergency, which is a 911 call, the BLS emergency, again, which is a 911 call, and the ALS 2, which is the emergency. The difference between ALS emergency and ALS 2 is the number of therapies or procedures you do. Uh, based on what Medicare allows, um, you can bill for a higher rate at ALS over 2 if you push multiple medications, if you use a cardiac monitor, if you do advanced therapies, things like that, and advanced airway. Um, an ALS level call is maybe just a monitor and an IV and that's it. So that's all done by our billing company. Um, so you don't do a lot of the interfacility facility The interfacility transfers, we did three this past fiscal year. And then the other two are the ALS non-emergency and the BLS non-emergency. You don't do those very often? Hardly any at all, because those are typically typically the ones done by the private ambulance companies who have the contract with those healthcare facilities. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then uh, as you go down, oxygen, airways, IV, defibrillation, extra tendon, those are all additional charges that are allowed under Medicare if you actually perform those therapies on the patients. So again, um, these rates have not changed. Um, uh, again, we're just uh, through the chair looking for a motion of endorsement going into the new fiscal year. Um, and obviously more than anything, just to give you folks a chance to ask questions or comments on anything as well. So, um, these are what the fire department will charge to an insurer, but the insurer may or may not pay the full amount. Depending on the carrier, that's correct. Um, and uh, is it, is it, I can't, I, 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 we had this conversation last 
question. I'm sorry for re-asking the same question. Nope. But, um, Medicare, these are higher, these are slightly higher than Medicare rates, is that right? Exactly. Any services across the state, um, whether it's private or publicly done, they base their rates off of what Medicare allows. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, if you look at the loss of emergency, if a Medicare individual um, using Medicare as their carrier, Medicare may only pay $250 for that call. Um, but then you go to a health New England plus whatever, then they pay $350 for that call. So all services, public or private, they adjust their rates um, with a percentage above what Medicare allows to recover some of the actual costs they incur throughout the year. So what you're saying, what you're saying is you use the you use sort of Medicare categories, but the cost per per uh, treatment might be higher. Yes. Thank you.